So it's great to be here in Brussels. Um, I've been here before. Uh, in the year 2002, I was here as a guest of the Flemish Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I wrote a novel about the life of your local painter, Peter Bruegel the Elder. And this is one of his more unsettling works. It's a drawing he did near the end of his life, the late 1500s. It's called The Beekeepers. And he, he drew this a month or two after Counts Egmont and Count Horn had been beheaded in the Grand Place uh, by, the, by the, the occupying Spanish troops. And uh, I've always thought that this picture, people have debated what this picture means, but I see it as him thinking about the baskets that they have on the stage when they execute somebody, the basket to catch the head. And so I think is what's in those baskets are human heads. And that relates to what I'm going to, some of the things I'm going to talk about today, because one, one thing that people are interested in is how to make a computer model of themselves or a web model of themselves or upload themselves. And, uh, well, if you could cut your head off, that's, that's one way of putting it at least onto something like a thumb drive. Now, um, I'm, I'm best known as a science fiction writer. I got a PhD in mathematics and I worked for 20 years as a professor in computer science in Silicon Valley. But uh, I've written about 20 novels, many of them in the cyberpunk vein. And uh, one of my first novels was called Software. And this, I think you could argue this is the first science fiction novel that presented the notion of people taking their personality and copying it onto a computer. This is a very commonplace notion now, but at that time, it wasn't a familiar idea. In the novel software, the, the robots are actually doing this to a man as a favor. They're preserving his brain. And the way they do it is to cut off the top of his head and eat his brain. And uh, when John Shirley and I were less professorial than we are now, we were in Austin, Texas. Uh, this would have been the early 1980s, and we were driving. It was sort of a Hunter Thompson scene. We were driving around town in a rented Cadillac, screaming things at the Texans. And John was leaning out the window, yelling, Y'all ever ate any live brains? How would you like to eat some live brains? So um, that's, there's a way of, of achieving this thing without being quite so violent. And it's a... It's a software that I think will be really kind of a growth industry in the next 10 years, something that I call a life box. And it's a way to make a computer model of your personality fairly simply. And the thing is, sometimes we don't really need that much AI. Uh, you can fake it if you have a large enough database and a good search engine and a, a sort of little front end that, that makes it look like you're talking to something. So if you can get enough data about your thoughts and your life, either if you're a writer, it's easy because you've got your journals. Otherwise, you could be extensively interviewed, uh, your photographs, your videos. You get a lot of data about yourself. You put that basically on a website. And then you put a front end on it. And uh, your grandchildren, after you're dead, can sort of interview it. They can ask it questions. And it will search out bits of answers from what you've said or written that will seem appropriate. Now, the life box on its own, uh, it's obviously it's not really, it's not going to write another novel for me after I'm dead. So how do you animate the life box? How do you put the ghost into the machine? Um, I taught AI at San Jose State, and one thing I learned is that the present state of artificial intelligence it's a grab bag of cheap tricks. It's like a magician's trunk. There's, you know, just various things in there that really have no relation to each other. Um, there's a feeling that we need some kind of insight. One, one thought that appeals to me is that uh, our normal notion of things that computers do, the sort of sequential logical thing, it's not really how our minds work. I think our minds are more like physical and biological processes. And this brings me to a type of computation I like very much called cellular automata. 
or they're called CAs for short. And uh, they sort of began hitting the public eye in the mid-1980s. And the way it works, something like this image you're looking at here, this was a very old one that I wrote in assembly language, and uh, those little squares are actually ASCII characters. And you would imagine this thing vib moving very rapidly, sort of cycling through a lot of changes, like a series of oriental rugs. And the way it works is each little square or pixel looks at the state of the neighboring pixels and updates its value on the basis of that. It takes the average and adds one. So we have something here like the surface, vibrating surface of water in a basin. And this is a type of computation that I like a lot because they're fairly physical. So at this point, I decided to stop being a mathematician and a freelance writer, and I let the chip into my heart, and I went and got a job teaching computer science. And uh, one of the things about cellular automata that is interesting is that they occur a lot in nature. Now here I'm holding a South Pacific cone shell to my head, and uh, the pattern on the cone shell, this is something Stephen Wolfram talked about a lot, that pattern is similar to a, cellular, a particular kind of cellular automaton pattern. Now, uh, I did a lot of work with cellular automata at San Jose State University where I was teaching, and this is one I was particularly fond of. It's uh, called Belusov Jabotinsky scrolls, or just Jabo. And uh, these things, again, they're, they're, they're twirling, they're emerging. You can start with a random screen, and this stuff comes out of it. It's very much like the emergence of life from the primeval ooze. And so this is where I think it's appealing. We can get these sort of biological sorts of computations happening. One thing, though, as I, I, I programmed a lot, I shipped four or five software products and worked at Autodesk and then went back to teaching. And the thing about programming that is kind of frustrating if you leave out a semicolon, your program disappears. If you leave out a semicolon in a novel, it doesn't matter. So uh, I, I began wondering if there could be a way to have a nicer, more direct interface to this object that I was working on. And so here I'm sort of imagining. This, this is a painting that I did, actually. I don't think I mentioned that. When I was writing my book on Bruegel, so as to see how it felt, I took up painting. And it's something I still do in sort of a casual way. Now, looking ahead, I started thinking, well, we need to get away from these stupid machines, these, you know, these brittle things, these chips. That's all going to go away. Um, the, uh, just like we don't use watches with gears, we're not going to be using chips in 50 or 60 years. And uh, what, so what we're going to see happening is more biological forms of computation. This is going to be the century of biotech. And extrapolating towards the year 3000, uh, by the way, I misread the conference title. It said the deep future, and I was like, oh, they mean the year 3000. So I'm off by uh, 950 years here. So we're, we're going to get a little bit more of a fast forward. So uh, I see there being these things that you wear on the back of your neck. And I call them ovies, and they're a little bit like slugs, and they're sending out these uh, electromagnetic signals and interacting with each other. And we're going to have something very much like telepathy. Uh, already a smartphone is somewhat like telepathy, but it's going to be a lot more. What these two people are doing, um, this is a, an illusion that could happen if you start looking at somebody's image of you, and they're looking at the image of you looking at them. You get into this hall of mirrors. It could be kind of freaky. Now, uh, one of the earliest biotech applications I expect to see, they'll take the skin of animals like cuttlefish and squid, which are very good at displaying all sorts of patterns, so we'll be culturing this stuff. We won't be making thin wafers of glass. We'll use cultured octopus skin or cuttlefish skin. And this, this character has some on his pillow, and uh, he can see things that he likes to see there. Um, the city of the future, it won't be anything that's mechanical. It's all going to be grown. So we're going to grow all the objects. We're going to grow our buildings. And we're going to even tweak ourselves, like that little guy on the lower, lower, left, lower left corner, or lower right corner there. He's sort of a Bosch Bruegel type guy. And 
he thought it would be cool <laughs> to look that way. People are going to do all sorts of things. They're not going to stop at mere <laughs> breast enhancement. There's a lot more. You can, or if you're going to enhance your breast, you might as well have six of them. That's going to be <laughs> the way to go, you know? Uh, the same for men, but let's not go into that. Uh, one image I like a lot is the idea of people growing houses. That's going to solve a lot of problems. You'll get this seed, it's sort of like a watermelon seed, as big as a pizza. And you get the ground nice and wet, and you push that thing into the ground and water it a whole lot. And you get something like an oak tree comes up. And the inside walls are going to be covered with that squid skin display that we use. And it's going to have, it'll draw some iron out of the ground and have some antenna wires so it can contact with the other trees. It'll have photosynthesis, of course, and there'll be nice little rooms. There'll be little cups in the walls that you can, you can throw trash or excretions into. The trees will absorb it. The tree will even give out some nice sap that you can drink. So uh, I don't see this as being at all impossible. This is something we can fairly easily do. If you start thinking in terms of a century, two centuries, this is all going to happen. Chips are going to go away. There's not going to be machines. We're going to be growing everything that we want. The people flying around there, well, why not have something a little like a manta ray that you can put on your back that acts as wings? Uh, if an engineer does the formula, so say there's not enough energy, well, we also should keep in mind that there's going to be some new form of energy that we'll discover. I mean, in 1900, they really didn't even know about radioactivity, okay? So there's going to be some stuff we can siphon something out of dark matter, dark energy, sub-dimensional physics. There's going to be some great new stuff coming online, possibly in our lifetimes. Now, an example of some way you can manufacture things, if you want a knife, uh, you won't build it, you'll plant things that will grow these stalks, it will get iron ore out of the soil, and you'll get a nice sharp knife growing on the tip there. So you can make anything you want with plants. And nanotechnology, I mean, we don't need nanotechnology. Biology is nanotechnology. Now, one more jump, after we get past uh, the biocomputational revolution, we get to something that I call, that is called hylozoism. And I just show you this word because people tend to think I made this word up, but it's a genuine Wikipedia word. I actually wrote a novel called Hylozoic as well. And hylo means matter and zoic is alive. And it's this idea that everything is alive. Every object is alive. Everything is conscious even though they don't have sensors, though they have kinds of sensors. Now, how can I say that a stone, a rock, is alive? Well, a stone, if you look into it, it's got a septillion or an octillion atoms in there. These atoms are connected by little fields. They're all vibrating. It's a quantum computation. There's an immense amount of stuff going on inside a stone. It's a universal quantum computer. It can emulate anything it wants to. The only thing is the stone might not be interested in talking to us. <laughs> How will we talk to the stone? Well, we'll probably have to work with that telepathy thing. We'll get some kind of... Being a science fiction writer, I don't have to fill in the details, okay? <laughs> uh, but we'll get some sort of quantum thing going, and we'll be able to talk to our objects. We won't need to glue uh, ARFID chips on them. We'll be able to talk to them directly and get them to do things that we like them to do. Now here's a little illustration. This is a sort of biotech world. Now if we look at it uh, in terms of the hylozoic world, we just get down to the raw underlying quantum fields. I actually made this image with a cellular automaton, and then I turned it into a painting. So you see, we go from biotech to uh, matter tech, the hylozoic world, and everything, every object is alive. We're not alone in the universe. Everything is conscious, everything is alive. Everything is our friend. We're not lost fireflies in some cruel warehouse of dead machinery. We are part of the living world. So then what? Well, who knows? Maybe we turn into flying jellyfish, whatever you like. We'll go down into the sub-dimensions. Uh, it's going to be a good world. It's going to get better. And uh, life is everywhere.
So that's it. Come on, Bob.